Great. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Bryce Wakefield. I'm a uh, prog program associate at the Asia Program here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, which, as many of you will know, is the official memorial to the only president ever to have held a PhD. And we therefore uh, honor President Wilson by bringing good scholars uh, to talk about policy, which are the two concerns of his life. And apropos good scholarship uh, related to good policy, we have here Shelley Rigger, who is going to tell us why Taiwan matters, which coincidentally is the title of her book. It's a very handsome book, and it's on sale outside for $30. $30. You'll notice the teal color scheme, not quite green, not quite blue. Uh, straight down the middle. Um, I'm sure many of you are uh, extremely familiar with uh, Professor Rigger's work. Um, these things being as they are, however, um, I'll tell you that she is also the author of Politics in Taiwan, Voting for Democracy, and From Opposition to Power, Ta Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party. Uh, as you know, she's published a number of articles on Taiwan's domestic politics, the national identity issue in Taiwan-China relations and related topics, and her current research studies the effects of cross-strait economic interactions on Taiwan people's perceptions of mainland China. She has a PhD from Harvard and is the Brown Professor of East Asian Politics and Chair of Political Science at David Davidson College in North Carolina. And without further ado, I will uh, evacuate so you can see the PowerPoint projection and uh, let Professor Rigger get on with it. Thanks. All right, well, thank you very much. Can you, in fact, see the PowerPoint projection? Okay, I'm, am I? I'm not in front of it. And turned an odd shade of green myself by being in the... I never like it when the speaker is standing in front of the PowerPoint with the landscape of lines and colors over her head. Well, thank you very much for coming, and thank you extra double plus much those of you who have actually bought a copy of this book today. That is um, the author's fondest hope. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here at the Woodrow Wilson Center and um, to be with friends who are interested in Taiwan. Some of the people in this room are actually quoted in this book, Mike Fonte and Nancy Tucker, and there may be someone that I can't see at this remove. Uh, actually contributed in their, no, I'm sorry, Warren, you're not <laughs> quoted in the book. Uh, With good reason, no doubt. You notice that, that that was Bob Hathaway speaking, for the record, not me. Uh, so it really is a, a delight to be here, and I appreciate your coming very much. So why Taiwan matters is the topic for today, and I think you all are well aware, whoops, that Taiwan is located off the southern coast, southeastern coast of mainland China. From the earliest visits foreigners made to Taiwan, it was known as Formosa, based on the Portuguese phrase, Ilha Formosa, which is apparently what the first traveler on a Portuguese vessel was said to have uttered when he laid eyes on this beautiful island. For a while in the middle of the 20th century, Taiwan was known as Free China. But more and more recently, Taiwan is thought of in international relations and in US foreign policy as a kind of problem. You know, now it seems that we have a Taiwan problem. Why do we have a Taiwan problem? What is the Taiwan problem and how can we maybe re consider the categorization of Taiwan as primarily a, a problematic factor in international relations and reorient our perspective. Well, Taiwan is a problem, or the, the, the or point of origin of the Taiwan problem is the Chinese Civil War. Taiwan got caught up in the Chinese Civil War for reasons that I'll discuss a little bit later on, and I think Part of the reason that Taiwan's situation has become so fraught in the contemporary environment is that for many people, especially in mainland China, resolving the Chinese Civil War requires 
resolving, in some sense, this Taiwan problem. So what is the PRC's position with respect to Taiwan? The PRC's position has changed over time. During the Mao era, it was clearly our goal is to liberate Taiwan, which means to bring Taiwan under the same government that existed in the People's Republic of China, to liberate it not only from uh, the Guomindang, the KMT government, the nationalist government that was ruling there, but also to liberate it from capitalism and all the other things that the Chinese Communist Party was interested in liberating Chinese people from. But after the Mao era ended, the policy toward Taiwan changed to a policy of peaceful unification, no longer violent, uh, forcible liberation, but peaceful unification. And in the subsequent years, there's even been some indication that the People's Republic of China might be interested in further evolving its position, although the suggestion that there might be further flexibility beyond the peaceful unification formula that has been at the basis, at the heart of China's policy for the last 30 years, these, these are more just hints and suggestions, and we don't really have authoritative um, statements of a new policy. But there does seem to be some possibility of further development. So what does Taiwan want? What's the position on the Taiwan side? Well, back in the days of Chiang Kai-shek, pictured here, uh, the, it was clear what the, at least the government on Taiwan wanted, which was to recover the mainland, to bring the rest of China, right, the, what Chiang Kai-shek thought of as the rest of China, back under the rule of the Republic of China government, the government that had been established in all of China in, well, sort of all of China, um, in 1912. It's a complicated story. <laughs> then in the 1980s and 90s, there was a surge in sentiment in Taiwan and, and actually beyond Taiwan among Taiwanese living around the world that really the idea of unifying with the mainland, of somehow bringing these two entities, the Chinese mainland and the island of Taiwan, under the same national government, was simply unnecessary or even undesirable. And there was strong enthusiasm in those years for the idea of Taiwan independence, of simply severing all claim to a Chinese identity for Taiwan. But most recently, I would argue, both independence and unification are less popular in Taiwan among Taiwanese people than simply preserving the current state of affairs, which lies somewhere between full-fledged unification, with the two sides being under a single flag, and full-fledged independence where there's no suggestion or possibility of a common identity or future uh, shared role for these two places. Entities. I get into trouble when I use words like country, state, nation, so I try to use words like entities and places, but inevitably um, I collapse into country before the talk is over. Um, so I think what Taiwan wants, or what Taiwanese people want fundamentally, is to preserve the status quo, to keep things the way they are. What is the U.S. position on Taiwan? Well, the U.S. position is expressed in a series of documents. The three communiques, which the U.S. government has signed with the People's Republic of China, and the Taiwan Relations Act, which is domestic legislation that instructs the U.S. government on how to handle this issue. The main import of this policy is to stress peaceful resolution of this problem, situation. According to the Shanghai communique, the first of these three documents, the U.S. acknowledges that all Chinese on either side, so in Taiwan and in the mainland, maintain there's only one China and Taiwan is part of it, but the U.S. doesn't actually endorse that position in the Shanghai communique. We simply said, we don't challenge this position. We understand that this is what you think, but whatever you do about it, it better be peaceful. 
Uh, we also have said in the Taiwan Relations Act that it is our policy that you know, any action needs to be peaceful. Any change in the status of Taiwan or the relationship between these two sides needs to be peaceful. And President Bill Clinton added yet another sort of layer to the cake when he said that uh, whatever resolution is reached between the two sides needs to have the assent of the people of Taiwan. And in saying this, President Clinton was acknowledging that by the 1990s, Taiwan had become a democracy and its government no longer had the standing to make decisions for its people without their consent. The sum of all of this is a policy of strategic ambiguity, right? We don't really say exactly what we want as a final outcome in the United States because we reserve the right to evolve our position or to adjust our position in response to the realities and developments on the ground in Taiwan and the PRC. So where does this leave us? Well, one thing we all know is that China's economic, political, and military power and influence around the world are increasing rapidly at a time, at indeed the very moment, when the U.S. is increasingly challenged in its ability to respond to or rise to the kinds of challenges that China is presenting. Meanwhile, that's happening in a context of a rapprochement or warming trend between Taiwan and the PRC that I would argue has left us in a situation today where Taiwan PRC relations or Taiwan mainland China relations are the best they have ever been ever in all of history, right? There has never been a moment in history when as so many people, so much money, so many goods were traveling back and forth constantly across the Taiwan Strait. And that, I think, has understandably prompted some people in the U.S. and elsewhere to raise this question. So if China is strong, the U.S. is extended, and the Taiwanese and the Chinese seem to be getting along fine, why should the U.S. continue to support Taiwan's efforts to hold itself apart from the PRC? And the answer, I would argue, is that because that it is in the interest of the U.S. to continue that policy because helping Taiwan avoid a unification that it doesn't want, a unification that is premature or coercive, serves the interests not only of the U.S. and Taiwan, but also of China as well. Briefly, uh, just to sort of lay out where we're headed, Taiwan matters to the world, it matters to the U.S., it matters to the PRC, and ultimately it matters to itself, which I think is not an insignificant point to make. It matters to the world as a model of economic development. It matters to the world as a model for peaceful democratization. It matters to the U.S. as a test case for American foreign policy and for a particular a arrangement of security commitments that have to the present uh, been very effective and successful. It matters as a canary in the coal mine of China's growing power. And resolving the Taiwan issue well matters also to the PRC. So briefly on the economic model front, why is Taiwan a model for the world economically? Well, because it has achieved an extraordinary level of economic development and economic growth, while at the same time preserving a remarkable degree of equity in distribution. So today, a lot of, you know, there isn't, as far as I know, probably someone in here will, will correct me, and I hope you will. As far as I know, there is not yet an, you know, Occupy Zhong Xiaodong Lu movement, but any day now I would expect there to be one because in Taiwan, there is a perception of inequality. And that perception is based on a rise in inequality from sort of historic levels. But compared to a country like the People's Republic of China or the United States, China, uh, Taiwan is still an incredibly equitable and, and sort of even society. And this is, I think, something that many developing countries strive to attain. And the Taiwan model is, if not something they can directly copy, it is at least proof that it can be done and a source of inspiration. 
Taiwan's miracle economy today is one that has moved beyond manufacturing, you know, making the stuff that when I was a kid made in Taiwan was, was a joke. You know, all the um, junky little things that we had, all the Barbies were made in Taiwan. Now, for my children, made in China is has that same kind of reputation and made in Taiwan well that's where their you know that's where their iPhones came from um, and maybe their iPhones have a actually my kids don't have iPhones my parents are here I need to clarify that you know they um, they really don't have iPhones but they, they know about iPhones and they know that iPhones are technically uh, assembled made in in China but they also know because they live with me that um, all the really good parts right are made in Taiwan. And made in Taiwan in many cases by large corporations with multinational reach, but also even today, Taiwan's economy is largely dependent on small and medium-sized enterprises, which make it a flexible economy and which help to support this growth with equity. As far as a democratic model to the world, uh, Chiang Kai-shek is sitting here on his throne in the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial under the word democracy, but there was not much democracy in Taiwan under Chiang Kai-shek, actually. But over the course of the 1980s and 90s, Taiwan transformed itself from a single-party dictatorship to a vibrant, multi-party, liberal democracy and accomplished this feat with remarkably little violence or bloodshed or social disruption. And this too, I think, especially in an age when uh, countries bankrupt themselves to impose democracy abroad by force unsuccessfully, this model has great power and importance. Taiwan is also important to the world because it is part of a security architecture that I would argue has maintained global stability and security and at least a reasonable amount of international peace since the end of World War II. And while Taiwan is no longer a formal ally of the United States, it is still a country that others look to. See, I did it. I called it a country. so. We're off to the races now. Uh, it is a country that other allies of the U.S. look to as a, an indicator, a litmus test, for how seriously the U.S. takes its security commitments around the world. If the U.S. retreats from Taiwan, decides that we can't afford this anymore, that you know we need to just kind of start letting go of things, and Taiwan is the first thing that we decide to let go of, the indication to Japan, to South Korea, and to many other allies around the world will be, well, we now have to assume that we are next, and we need to step up and start thinking about investing more in our own security, which I think is a sobering prospect for all of us. Taiwan is also important internationally because it is, as our colleague and good friend at the Brookings Institute, Richard Bush, likes to say, a kind of indicator of how China will be as it rises. As the PRC's power increases, how will it use its power? What will it do with the influence it gains around the world? How the PRC treats Taiwan is one of the indicators for how it is likely to be as a great power in the world. Finally, I would argue that Taiwan matters, and resolving the Taiwan question well matters for China, for the People's Republic of China, because a failed unification attempt would be a catastrophe for the PRC. And this is some public opinion data from 2008 in Taiwan, where we see that about 60% of Taiwanese would like to be independent if they thought they could achieve that without any cost. So that, you know, the PRC wouldn't be upset about it, so, you know, we just sign the divorce papers and are done with it. That would be okay with most, but not by any means the overwhelming majority of Taiwanese. At the same time, though, about 40% say, you know what? If we were just like them in all the important ways, we could unify. That would be okay, too. And about a quarter of Taiwanese, if you ask them, are you for independence under certain circumstances or unification under certain circumstances, answer, yes. Yes, we are.
right? Either way is okay with us. So the, the possibility of some kind of unification is not foreclosed, but the opportunity for unification is not present. So for the PRC to compel Taiwan into a unification prematurely could squeeze out that 24 percent or that 38 percent who say they could tolerate unification and turn Taiwan against the PRC in a way that would make the future resolution of this issue that much more difficult. But finally, I want to argue, and, and probably Washington, D.C. is the wrong place to make this argument. I have felt a lot more uh, at home talking this way in uh, San Francisco last week, um, where we're all wearing, you know, flowers in our hair and stuff. Um, but I think it is important to remember that all peoples have a right to be understood as means as ends in themselves and not only as means to the ends of other nations. So Taiwan is, it has a role in U.S. foreign policy. It is of interest to the U.S. It has a role in the PRC. It is of interest to the PRC. But it also has goals of its own. Its people have goals of their own. And I think that needs to be regarded and taken seriously in international conversations. Where does this Taiwan thing come from as a force in the world that needs to be taken seriously and reckoned with on its own terms? I think it comes from history. Taiwan's history has molded on that island a unique society and culture with an identity that is different from any other in the world. The first inhabitants of Taiwan were the aboriginal people who are of Malayo-Polynesian descent, not Chinese at all, but uh, they were soon followed in the 1500s and 1600s by waves of migration from mainland China, so that the aboriginal or indigenous foundation is then overlain by a Chinese majority. But in 1895, Taiwan became a Japanese colony and another layer of or another overlay of cultural and uh, social practice became important to Taiwanese people. And I love this picture because these are the skinniest sumo wrestlers I have ever seen. And then, of course, in 1945, Taiwan was incorporated into the Republic of China, but only briefly because, as I noted before, the Civil War intervened and the two sides were split after 1949. So what you have in Taiwan is you have a culture and a society that is certainly Chinese in very important ways, but it is also uniquely and specifically Taiwanese, and it is also, I think, in a way different from other parts of the Chinese cultural world, global. And I think that is evident in Taiwan's high culture. This is the... um, Cloudgate Dance Theater, probably the most significant high culture export that Taiwan has. And the choreographer, Lin Huai Min, has very, is very forthright and intentional in saying that he is influenced by his identity as a Chinese. So the uh, one performance, Cursive, is built around the creation of Chinese characters by the dancers with their bodies and paint but that he could not make this art outside of Taiwan. And also that for Lin Huai Min, being a participant in a global vocabulary of modern dance is an essential part of the art that he creates. So you can see it in high culture. You can also see it in pop culture. My current favorite song would be the Bobby song by Lotus Wong which is a very Chinese looking video, if you watch the video, and I urge you to do so. Um, Just YouTube, you know, and then search on Bobi Lotus Wong. Uh, The video is very Chinese, but it is also totally Taiwanese. If you you, um, print out the lyrics, they make no sense in Mandarin whatsoever. They're unintelligible outside of the Taiwanese language. 
Um, but the song itself is a cover of a Korean pop song. So it's part of the Korean wave. And my new favorite video uh, is this one, which I think perfectly captures the predicament and preoccupations of Taiwan's youth. A young Taiwanese man who is traveling the world, videotaping himself, dancing silly dances in the uh, San Taizu, third prince costume, because, as he says, I could not just stand by and watch my country, Taiwan, get bullied internationally. I want people to know there is a country called Taiwan and what an amazing place it is. So, in conclusion, cross-strait relations are obviously very strong, as strong as they have ever been, and there is no appetite, I think, on either side to unravel or detach these connections. But Taiwan is still at the heart of its own experience and the, at the heart of its own consciousness and identity. So this is the opening page of the Mainland Affairs Council website, and it instructs us to open the main door and go to the mainland. Why or in what spirit? In the spirit of putting Taiwan first for the benefit of the people. And then over on the other side, it says the door is open. Mundakai. And then another phrase, unintelligible in Mandarin, right? Wang Gu Tzu. We are guarding the house. So the door god is Taiwanese, and he is guarding the house. So even the Mainland Affairs Council, the spokesperson for the ROC government, makes it clear that the purpose of Mainland Affairs, the purpose of going to the the mainland is to solidify Taiwan itself and that going to the mainland there will always be the door god protecting Taiwan. So after a century when I think it's fair to say Taiwan really turned its back to the west, turned its back to its back toward China in other words, looked toward Japan, looked toward the US, we see Taiwan now addressing China once again. This is the uh, mouth of Kaohsiung Harbor overlooking the Taiwan Strait, where all of the ships go in and out constantly carrying goods to the mainland. So in that light, there are many possibilities for the future. But I think it is important to keep in mind that reaching an outcome that will serve all the interests on all sides of this issue requires recognizing that for Taiwan, Taiwan is at the heart, is at the center, and it cannot be removed from its own equation. So with that, I will um, put up my shameless promotion picture and take your questions. Okay, before we move into questions, let, rem let me remind you that the book is Why Taiwan Matters. Uh, it's normally about 33 bucks, but uh, today you can buy it outside for $30. And if you pay the, yes, if you pay the extra $3, you can get it signed. <laughs> I'll sign it for nothing. Oh, you can give me the $3. Okay. <laughs> right, so um, standard procedure, raise your hand uh, when identified. Um, Please tell us your name and any affiliations you might have. And it looks like the person who pays my check is has a question, so he can go first. <laughs> uh, oh, Sue was supposed to be here, but okay. Well, I'll shout. Um, I'm Bob Hathaway. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Norbert. Uh, Shelley, very good presentation. Uh, you'll be delighted to know that the library has a copy of your book, which was in my hands upstairs, and I look forward to, uh, to reading it. Um, early on in your presentation, you hinted, and you said you really didn't, couldn't go beyond hints, um, that Beijing might be evolving in the way it's thinking um, about Taiwan beyond peaceful reunification. Um, you said they haven't gotten very far and therefore it's murky, but I would invite you to speculate based upon the limited hints we do have what might replace peaceful, reuni peaceful reunification. Right. I think what has been said that is most interesting to people in Taiwan and beyond is that 
Taiwan and China are both parts of a China which is neither the PRC nor the ROC. That's the implication. I don't think it's ever been put in quite those words. And the suggestion then is that China is a kind of larger entity than the PRC alone. Liberation and peaceful unification take the PRC as definitive of China and require that Taiwan be sort of slotted into the PRC in some way. Now, it might not be in the same way that Hubei is slotted into the PRC. It might not even be in the same way that Hong Kong is slotted into the PRC, but it implies that Taiwan becomes a part of the PRC. The suggestion that, that in fact, there is a sort of cosmic China that is simultaneously both and neither, right, the mainland or the PRC and the ROC, suggests a kind of marriage of equals. And I think that kind of thinking is far more likely to interest people in Taiwan in the future than any kind of what it's hard to distinguish from a kind of annexation plan would do. Okay, if we could go across the table for ease of yeah, Mike. Thanks, Shelley. Mike Fonte. I'm the Washington liaison for the DPP. Um, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen was here a month or so ago, and I think she ran into precisely what you just spoke about. That is, the perception on the part of some that there's flexibility, potential flexibility in the Chinese side. As you know, or many people here might know, Wang Yi was here, said if uh, the DPP thinks that the 92 consensus under which they're working now is just a CCP KMT consensus, we can form a new consensus. And we could do it under the basis of a one China framework, he said. And then he stopped and he supposedly raised his hand and said, notice I didn't say one China principle, which presumes, I, I think people here, some people here in the government expected Tsai to respond to that, quotes, flexibility. Not everybody agrees that there, uh, you know, this is in the weeds here, excuse me, but for me, this is important stuff. Um, not everybody agrees that there was much flexibility. There are some analysts who think there was flexibility in that term. I think there's probably some people in, in sections of the U.S. government that hopes there's flexibility, but the EPP does not think there's much flexibility there. It's still one China. And I think the point that I would make, and I think Dr. Tsai has made, Kim has made, is that the DPP wants to keep all options open for the people of Taiwan. Seems to me that's close to what you were just talking about, about the Taiwanese people matter and their opinions matter and they ought to be able to give their assent to whatever the future is. I don't think, and I'd like to hear you out on this, that the Chinese really believe that independence is still an option because there is that one China framework within which they have to, how they put those pieces together is a question, but I think that's the difference between a DPP position and what I think is the KMT position at this point. And so that's where there's a lot of rub, and I think that's what, as you know, Dr. Tsai hit a little bit of a bumpy patch here with somebody in the NSC giving a quote to the Financial Times saying the stability won't continue if she gets to be elected. Well, but that's where the rub is, I think. How you view options in the future and whether all options ought to be remain open so that people have that assent of the people of Taiwan phrase, or whether you have to work within the one China framework however vaguely defined. Yeah, I would just say that um, this one China framework is in line with a lot of sort of, well, when it has been useful to PRC spokespeople and leaders to sound very reasonable, then they say something new and interesting. But the question is whether they follow up and whether there is any kind of authoritative statement. And so far, I think there just hasn't been, you know, we can, we can collect all these little pieces, but do they assemble into any kind of serious, you know, would you jump out of a plane under that parachute? Not me. Um, so I think it needs to be more authoritative and it needs to be more consistent and it needs to be uh, the same inside and outside and it needs to be at, in some way 
reflected in international policies, so how the PRC deals with Taiwan in international organizations. And, you know, this tension between wanting to say nice things to people in Taiwan so that they will be enticed into uh, feeling safe, while at the same time, you know, beating on Taiwanese people in international forums, you know, why would we expect Taiwanese people to assume the best when they're caught in this? Great. My name is A.C. Kuoyama, and uh, I'm a Japanese-American, first woman of the SEC, Seattle Exchange Commission. Um, my uncle, we spread all over the world. We came here and Philadelphia, our family, and it's about six sons. One, one son went to Taiwan, and he became the, the, uh, a principal of an agricultural college in Taiwan. And I was often wondered why uh, Taiwan, was, from, from my view, was really originally a Malay country, as you said. <coughs> and that also that the Chinese influence came with Chiang Kai-shek, which are Han Chinese mostly. And the Chinese themselves are a great many types of Chinese. And the Han Chinese are the ones who are the most numerous. And so therefore, all that China really needs to do is to send immigration to China. Chiang Kai-shek sent 30 or 40,000 in their army, send another 100,000 immigrants to, to Taiwan, and Taiwan would become Chinese anyway. So uh, it would be a simple matter of, of just sending boatloads of Chinese to, to Taiwan <coughs> and take over Taiwan. <laughs> well, you know, there are a lot of people in Taiwan who are intensely worried about this, and they're not coming in boats. They're coming on airplanes, and they're not coming um, at, to settle. They're coming to get married. Um, in the last decade or so, there's been a huge influx of PRC women entering Taiwan to marry Taiwanese men who find it difficult to marry, both because there's a little bit of a, an uneven sex ratio in Taiwan as there is in mainland China, but also because a lot of Taiwanese women just don't want to get married because it's like Japan, you know, it's no fun being married in Taiwan. Uh, it might be fun if you marry the right guy, but it's not that fun if you don't. So uh, there's been this influx of, of women from the PRC, and many Taiwanese are, are very concerned that this will change the identity of Taiwan people. Um, I tend to think that Taiwan identity is pretty, pretty robust, and that, if anything, the Chinese women are likely to find themselves more feeling more akin to and raising their children as Taiwanese. But we'll see. The, you know, the world never stops moving. People keep going. And the ways things change are often unpredictable. Um, just to plug the Wilson Center's own publications, outside you'll find um, a publication called Greater China, I think, um, in which this very issue is covered, the issue of um, mainland migration to Taiwan for the purposes of marriage. And it's free, so it's an even better deal than why Taiwan <laughs> matters. I'll even sign it if you want. <laughs> okay, who's next? Helen, did you have a question? <laughs> uh, you gave such a comprehensive and delightful talk. Questions kept coming up in my mind and then you'd answer them. So I'm going to ask a kind of a silly question. Kemoi and Matsu, they're in the Taiwan Strait, right? Are there people there or are they just rocks? And what would happen <laughs> if petroleum were found in the ocean between Taiwan and China? Now, you don't have to answer that if you don't want to. <laughs> well, actually, the, the um, Kemoi and Matsu are really interesting because what's happened in recent years is that these two islands, which are actually in, they're sort of nestled in the Chinese coast. They're much closer to the PRC than they are to Taiwan, but they, for various 
military and historical and political reasons, they were retained as part of the ROC. And for years, for decades, they were just military outposts, especially Kamoi or Jinman. Um, but now they are increasingly becoming a kind of bridge between Taiwan and the mainland. And the people there are increasingly kind of confused and unsure how to position themselves. Um, there's a huge controversy, two huge controversies on Kamoi. One is should we build a bridge to mainland China? Because if we do that, then people can just drive back and forth. And that would be good in a lot of ways, but it would also just be really weird. Um, and then the other big controversy is should we have a casino? Because, you know, that would make a lot of money. But no, the, the Macanese would not like it at all. So, uh, and then Mazu has become important in the religious life of Taiwan people because um, Mazu is linked to the rest of the Matsu cult, which is the, the biggest religious cult or, you know, the biggest branch of Taiwanese folk religion. Um, and so both of these islands have sort of gotten a heightened identity as Taiwanese are now looking for ways to get across to the mainland and to make connections with people in the mainland that are not necessarily like government to government or, or big scale country to country political connections, but just lo little people to people, village to village, temple to temple connections. Right, Nancy. Um, Bryce, if you would allow me while we're waiting for Nancy to get the phone. There are a number of people here who may not be aware of this because they're of their age, but Komoi and Matsu were the source of um, two very serious crises in the 1950s between the U.S. And, and the PRC in the years immediately after the end of the Korean War. And indeed, if correct me if I'm wrong, Shelley, if I remember correctly, in the 1956 presidential election in this country, um, they were uh, a, a, a source of considerable uh, contention and debate and discussion as to, to what extent uh, we were prepared to shed uh, American blood to defend these islands. It was Seems 1960. Like 60. <laughs> Thank you. And there's actually uh, one of my favorite, well, I have a lot of little anecdotes about what life is like in Taiwan in this book, but one that I really I'm touched by is the in uh, Kamoi, because of the magnitude of some of the battles that were fought there, there are these huge battlefields and people are constantly turning up human remains in there as they do agriculture and other things. And they have developed a whole subcategory of local religious practice, which is the, the construction of temples to patriotic generals, they're called. So what you do is if you turn somebody up in your garden, then you, you, know, you rebury him, but you build a little temple to the, to the patriotic general, and you call in spirit mediums who can help you identify who this person was and, you, and, and what this person needs in the afterlife. And so all of these lost spirits, these people who died without ever being recovered, are being uh, catered to by Jinman residents in the afterlife. And it's partially because, you know, obviously we're scared that there'll be hungry ghosts and cause trouble for us. But also I think there is an element of, of empathy for these lost souls that can be cared for. And it doesn't matter, you know, what side they fought on or who they were. They, the patriotic generals, by virtue of having died alone on Jinman, are entitled to respect and deification in these little temples. Uh, Nancy Bernkoff Tucker, Georgetown University, and a senior scholar here at the Wilson Center. Shelley uh, is, of course, a wonderful book. Um, and, but I want to go in a slightly different direction. And I know in the process of writing this, you spent some time on the mainland in Shanghai and, and talking to people on the mainland about Taiwan. Um, as Chinese nationalism becomes something we talk more and more about, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about 
whether Taiwan matters to people in, on the mainland rather than to the government. I, I, going back a few years, I remember um, conversations in taxi cabs that Warren and I had uh, where the taxi cab drivers said, why should I care about Taiwan? I care about jobs. I care about whether my kids will get into a school and, and that sort of thing. On the other hand, the educational system uh, on the mainland talks a lot about uh, Taiwan being a, an essential part of what China is. So what would your assessment be about whether people care? I think it is a reflex for people in the PRC. Um, I remember, speaking of taxi drivers, I was in a taxi with my research assistant in Shanghai, who's a Taiwanese guy, not a man of few words is August He. Um, and so it, we were well into the ride when the taxi driver finally said, so where are you from? And he said, I'm from Taiwan. And the guy says, oh, Taiwan is part of China. Like a, like a reflex, you know? And I think that that's true. And my, I have two PRC students right now in my Chinese politics class. And they, they both, without any prompting from me, used the word brainwashing to describe how they were educated about Taiwan. But I think it is really impossible for us to, to infer from that that, there is, that this is indeed a high priority for ordinary PRC people. However, it is certainly a high priority for the kind of active and assertive nationalists who, for reasons of the Chinese Communist Party's own making, have become the one voice in China that has to be attended to, right? So the rest of Chinese society has been largely silenced, but the, the aggressive nationalists have been allowed to speak and have, in fact, at certain critical junctures, been encouraged to speak. So now we have the Chinese Communist Party leadership speaking back to us and saying, well, we have to say this because these people on the internet are rabid for this thing, <clears throat> which makes me wonder, why is it that the only people rabid for anything on the Chinese internet are the, you know, the ones who are rabid for Taiwan? So I think that, that this is, a, this is a, a, a kind of malady of Chinese politics today that is, on the one hand, unnecessary, but on the other hand, very real. Um, Shu Lim from the Chinese Media Net. May I ask two questions one by one? OK. Um, first of all, um, a, a few weeks ago, there was this heated debate about um, the U.S. may gradually uh, abandon Taiwan and maybe um, uh, do some modification to the six assurances. I uh, want to ask about your comment on that. Okay, well, first of all, you should read Nancy Tucker and Bonnie Glazer's article in the Washington <laughs> Quarterly uh, addressing precisely that debate. And then you should also read uh, my article, which I promise you it will be out any day now from the American Enterprise Institute on the same matter. Um, there are many, many, many responses one can make to this line of argument that says the U.S. essentially can no longer afford to maintain a, com a security commitment to Taiwan, and we need to just cut our losses and move on. And, and, you know, that's overstating it to some extent. The people who have made this argument most prominently, um, Admiral Bill Owens, um, Bruce Gilley, Charles Glazer, and Chaz Freeman, their arguments are a little more subtle than that, but I think when you take them all four together, that's pretty much what they add up to. There are many reasons that I could give you for why I think that's a bad idea, but I'm just going to give you one because I think it is in some ways the most uh, likely to be wrong one, right? Which is that I think that the time is, I, I firmly believe, as a matter of fact, that the time is not right for unification now. That the possibility of unification in the future is not absolutely foreclosed, especially if there is some kind of, you know, marriage of equals formula. We make a new flag with a golden dragon and we're both equally under it, something like that. Who knows? People not yet born may have creative ideas that I cannot conceive of. But right now, I don't think it's going to work. So 
for the PRC leadership, it is important to have reasons to give precisely to those rabid nationalists to say, we cannot satisfy your demand at this time. The easier, the harder it is for them to, for the, Ch for the CCP leadership to make the case, this is too costly, this is too dangerous, we can't do it now. The easier it is for them to make that case, the better it is all around. For the U.S. to withdraw its security assistance from Taiwan, to leave Taiwan defenseless or relative or, or less defensible anyway, Taiwan would not be defenseless even all on its own, but to, to leave Taiwan with a sort of depleting defense capability only tempts those nationalists in the PRC to ratchet up their demands on their own government for some kind of decisive action. And this, I think, is the kind of dynamic that could cause the PRC to miscalculate and to act against the better judgment of the CCP leadership, who I think understand the situation actually pretty well. So I think the U.S. has a responsibility to keep you know, to keep this table from wobbling so that we don't all fall down. What's your second question? Uh, my second question is that uh, the day before yesterday, four uh, Taiwan co-chairs in the U.S. Senate has written a letter to Defense Secretary Panetta to sort of remind him of the six assurances because he mentioned in his peri uh, uh, previous speech that uh, uh, the, the U.S. sort of had given the Chinese a heads up before the arms sale decision was formally uh, uh, announced. And then, um, but the Taiwan Defense uh, Minister, uh, minister uh, Mr. Yang Nianzu, uh, this morning uh, has, uh, this morning said uh, in response to uh, a reporter's question that um, there is um, little point in requiring more explanation on, uh, on, on, on the word heads up, since the, the US government has sort of said that um, uh, uh, the mentioning of this heads up uh, has nothing to do with uh, violating the six references. And um, I was wondering, and I want to know um, your comment, why do the U.S. congressmen seem to be more eager than the Taiwan defense minister <laughs> uh, to, uh, um, yeah, uh, um, uh, to um, that the, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, defense uh, secretary to 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 pay attention to the six references, and I I I wonder, on um, um, which do you think? Um, is a more proper way, whether it's to remind him um, to to stick to the six references, or you think that the fact will um, it, it, it will just explain to itself. Yeah. Ah, I knew there was a hard question cloaked in that candy bar of a softball, right? It was never a softball. When I, when I thought the question was going to be, you know, uh, something about arms sales, I was going to make Nancy answer it. But that is a very good question. Why are U.S. senators more concerned about the six assurances than the Taiwanese defense minister? I think there are two ways one could answer this question. One is that the Taiwanese defense minister is insufficiently attentive to the defense needs of his own country. But I don't think that's right, actually. I really don't. Um, the other is that members of the U.S. Senate are looking for a way to rebuke the administration for its insufficient attentiveness to Taiwan's defense needs as they perceive it. And so they need to say something. And this is a thing that they can say. So I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of unhappiness about the arms sales that uh, Taiwan didn't get everything that it asked for in the arms sales, specifically instead of F-16 CDs, got an upgrade of uh, older um, aircraft. and. My guess is that there are people in the in Congress who want to remind the administration, you know, 
be tough, don't cave to China on this issue, and this was a way for them to do that. But there's another, another way to answer the question, which is that it is often the case that we here in the U.S. understand and perceive and analyze and assess Taiwan's interests and needs differently from the way people in Taiwan do. And this is just very challenging for all concerned. Uh, yeah, Yafeng Xia, I'm a fellow here this year. Uh, my question is, uh, you talk about during uh, Mao's time, China talk about the uh, liberation of Taiwan by force. Uh, uh, I think uh, the PRC talk about the peaceful uh, unification starting from 58. So you, you might want to comment on that. Uh, the other is, uh, uh, what, what is the problem with Deng Xiaoping's uh, formula, that is one country, two system, uh, which uh, I think the PRC talked a lot in the 1980s. Uh, I'm not sure whether you touched this in your book. My last question is, uh, if China become a democracy, uh, do you think it might be easier for Taiwan to accept unification? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that, that probably the dividing line of 1979 is oversimplified, you know, that that's when everything changed. And that's a fair point that I'll try to incorporate in the future. Um, on the one country, two systems question, you know, that's very interesting because one country, two systems is usually described as having been developed for Taiwan, but sort of tried out in the case of Hong Kong. So it causes people to ask the question, how does the Hong Kong model or Hong Kong example, what, what information can we gather for Taiwan from Hong Kong's experience? And that question, which is not exactly the one you asked, but is the one that I'm gonna answer. I love that question because it allows me to say that being a scholar of China in 2011 is the best possible thing for a person to be. This is without a doubt the most fascinating, fast moving, magnificent part of the world. So every time I answer the question about Hong Kong, it's a different answer. You know, I taught my Japanese politics course from, 2000, from 1995 to 2005 with hardly ever even changing the notes. But my Chinese politics class, new books, new notes, new lectures, new everything every year because China moves so fast. And on this Hong Kong issue, it's particularly clear that this is a fast moving target. So initially, I think a lot of Taiwanese had this reaction. Hong Kong has nothing to do with us. We were never a colony of anybody. There is nobody who can give us away. And so it's just not applicable. It's not a relevant formula. And then for a while, we had people saying, well, you know, actually, it's not as bad as we thought it would be. It seems like things are going OK in Hong Kong. So maybe we shouldn't worry so much, and we should look at this. And then people started to say, no, 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 no. Look, just because their economy is not collapsing doesn't mean everything's fine. Look at what's happening politically. Now, I think increasingly, people in Taiwan are pointing to Hong Kong as evidence for why one country, two systems doesn't work for China because Hong Kong people will not quit. They keep speaking Cantonese. They keep fighting for their language. They keep opening new human rights organizations in Hong Kong. That's inside of China. They keep demanding elections. They keep doing these Hong Kong people things instead of blending into the PRC the way they were supposed to. And they have these politicians in Hong Kong who are really working to try and hide the reality on the ground and make Hong Kong look more like the rest of China. I read an article today about a, a Hong Kong politician lecturing other Hong Kong people, you know, why you cause so much trouble for Beijing government? Shut up. But Hong Kong people are not like that. So I think today, my answer to the Hong Kong question is what one country, two system shows us is that if you let that sec second system persist, 
it will continue to cause you problems for a long time. You had a third question, but I forgot what it was. The democracy, oh, yeah. uh, it might be uh, easier for Taiwan. <clears throat> uh, actually, I want to add the footnotes to what you just said. I think uh, the one country, uh, two system actually helps many of the mainland scholars. Now, many of their books can't cop cannot be published in mainland China, but they get published in, in Hong Kong. Yeah, it's like <laughs> grafting a part of another animal onto your body, you know? It might be nice to have a tail. I would love to have a tail, actually. Um, one of those prehensile tails that monkeys have that you can pick things up with it. But I don't think it would fit. You know, I think it would cause me a lot of trouble. Um, so maybe if China became, became democratic, if the rest of the PRC became democratic and Hong Kong became fully democratic, then Hong Kong would fit better into the Chinese body politic. Um, the issue of, of Chinese democratization is one that has strong arguments on two sides when it comes to Taiwan. There's one, set, one argument that says if China becomes democratic, then all those, uh, those aggressive nationalists are just going to, you know, they're going to take over the government and they're going to make, they're going to make bad choices, as we tell our little people, don't make bad choices. Um, the other argument, though, is that they will be, the, the true interests of people in mainland China will be evident to everyone, and it will be obvious that of all the things that China needs to do, unifying Taiwan by force is not one of them. And I, I think that this is one of those questions that one can legitimately answer with the ultimate weaseling out which is to say it depends. You know, it depends upon what the nature of PRC democratization is. If it's like s Russian democratization, uh, that's not, I don't think that's good for Taiwan. But if it's like Taiwan's democratization, that might be okay. Yes, that's also true. Kikuchi-san. <clears throat> uh, I have to... My name is Kikuchi, and uh, after being here since 1960, I'm still Japanese. And I have to preface my statement by saying that I don't mean disrespect to anyone. But uh, first point is um, you mentioned that looking at 100 years, the past century of uh, Taiwan, and you quickly said the first 50 years... Uh, uh, Japan had colonized uh, Taiwan. And I just wanted to draw the line that uh, the colonization of Taiwan, as far as I'm concerned, was more like an annexation of Taiwan into part of Japan, uh, which is different from the way the Europeans colonized, say, Vietnam or Indonesia or India or so forth. Uh, the entire infrastructure of Taiwan was starting with education, uh, was the same as in Japan uh, until 1945. So I still meet many uh, Taiwan friends who are my age or older who speak fluent Japanese. And also, perhaps they're polite to me, but they do not uh, uh, talk of the terrible quote if there were any experiences under the Japanese administration. Uh, secondly, when you talked about the development of Taiwan's economy, uh, and also products from Taiwan and China. Uh, you could have used the word Japan, uh, take it back 30 years, and then uh, that's how Japan knows. That is, there's a tremendous amount of similarity in the path that Taiwan took and Japan took. And finally, as far as the uh, questions about Hong Kong or about the issues of, um, let's say, unification, I'd say my optimistic feeling is that in 20 or 30 years, that would be a non-issue because just as the Hong Kong people are speaking Hong Kong, uh, Guandanese, uh, I noticed when I went to uh, 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 Chengdu, they were talking Sichuan. People in Taiwan are talking Fujian. And uh, people in Japan are talking Japanese. People in Korea, uh, meaning Japan and China, I mean Japan and Co Korea are part of the Chinese cultural influence. We just happen to be independent. 
and I will place Taiwan as being somewhere in between. And in another 20 years, uh, perhaps the whole amount of China itself would become a democratic federation in many ways, with perhaps a central sort of governing body in Beijing, but with greatly increased autonomy elsewhere. I think no one would take any offense at anything you've said. Actually, I think that's all very accurate about the Japanese experience in Taiwan. The only thing that might offend some people is that the Chinese Federation would be headquartered in Beijing when we all know that the true center of the Chinese Federation must be Shanghai. <laughs> Great, we've got time for a few more. There's one down the back there. Hi, Nathan Eberhardt with the State Department. Um, and my question is about the economic integration cross-strait that, uh, that you spoke of. Um, I get the sense that a lot of people consider it to be um, kind of a safeguard for Taiwan, that the more, the more valuable they are economically to China, the less likely China is to reunify by force. Um, but I think at the same time that there's a risk of eroding kind of the legitimacy of their international space um, with other part, you know, with other players uh, in the world, if they look and see that Taiwan is more and more and more, you know, economically and everything just really a part of China, you know, if 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 that's the way that it goes. And so, um, I guess my question is, how do the people who argue for status quo um, keep status quo from becoming a moving target? And then, you know, on the economic question, you know, how do you think that? How do you think that falls on the balance? You know, this kind of Marxist economic determinism is very surprising in the 21st century. Um, that, that the nature of nations should be determined by their economic relationships, right? That this, the, sup, the substructure determines the superstructure. Like, like, where is that coming from? But I know what you mean, though. Um, because, and I think that, I think that here's, here's the thing. <clears throat> we have two entities that are currently governed separately, they have the same historical background, the same kind of um, history of settlement and so on. They have a shared culture and language. They are one another's clo uh, number one trading partners and very porous, constant movement back and forth across borders. The relations up between the two are excellent, so it seems absolutely inevitable that Canada and the U.S. will unify any day now. <laughs> Why do we have this expectation for Taiwan and China? I mean, we don't even have this expectation really for the countries of the European Union, which actually are endeavoring to unify. We have this expe expectation about Taiwan and China because of the rhetoric that's been put forth over the last 80 to 100 years by elites in China. And then some of those elites moved themselves to Taiwan after 1945 and started the, this discourse going there. But in terms of human history, I, you know, there's no particular inevitability. Countries come together, countries come apart. Yugoslavia, not Yugoslavia, ex-Yugoslavia, Soviet Union, Soviet disunion. So the, I, I think there is a kind of feeling of inevitability that people have based on their having sort of imbibed this expectation, which is really a political position promoted by, as I said, you know, elites in China, and also because it would, let's face it, solve a problem. You work for the State Department, you know, the last thing you need is more problems. So wouldn't it be nice if we could just solve this one? The problem is that, of course, for people in Taiwan, they are more than simply your problem. And I think their desire to benefit from a mutually advantageous economic relationship with their neighbor and their willingness not to antagonize other entities in the region, that this should make them more and more dispensable in our eyes. There's some serious irony there, right? When Taiwan misbehaves, we all pay attention. I get invited to come to Washington, you know, like once a month. My sister knows this. I 
crash in her house constantly. When Taiwan is being good, not causing trouble, not scaring the horses, I have to write a book. Thirty dollars <laughs> available from all good bookstores. <laughs> right, uh, one more. Or not? Oh, good Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, hi, Aaron Cyril at the East West Center. I guess just sort of going on the last uh, question. What is the likelihood of the status quo continuing? I mean, it's been going for a few decades. Is that? Is it continuable, or is there a choice that has to be made at some point? I Thanks. think it is sustainable for a while longer. I mean, it's really hard to say, but it seems to me that the PRC has huge problems, big fish to fry, a lot of things that are not going to get any easier. Uh, we are now seeing, I think, evidence for economic slowdown in China attendant upon the, you know, they, they sort of stimulated their way out of the recession one time, but it's the recession is still with us. And, you know, there is a limit even to the resources of the Chinese Treasury to find a way to, in a healthy fashion, continue economic growth when there is no growth in the world at large. So, you know, I think they got all kinds of trouble. So I don't see any reason for the PRC to be uh, impatient about this issue in the near to mid term, but things can happen, you know, that, that are game changing events, and those I can't predict. Great. Let's wrap things up here. Um, join me in buying Professor Rigger's <laughs> book $30 outside or $33 in the bookshop or on Amazon.com, where you can also buy it in digital format for any devices you might have. By, by both. <laughs> um, okay, join me in applauding uh, Shelley for what's been a great event. <laughs>